In Jesus' name we pray. Heavenly Father, we bless your name for bringing us together. Thank you for the work you have committed to our hands. And we pray, Lord, that this work will prosper in every hand in Jesus' name. We bless your name for what you are teaching us and revealing to us in your word. I will pray that tonight you wake every one of us up in Jesus' name. Amen. Speak your word to everyone. Amen. Keep us awake. Amen. And I pray that every word that comes to each one will not throw it to other people in Jesus' name. Amen. We thank you for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're coming to you, 1 Samuel chapter 31. I'm reading from verse 3, and then the first part of verse 6. 1 Samuel chapter 31, verse 3. And the battle went so against Saul, and the archers hit him. And he was so wounded of the archers. Verse 6, so Saul died. So Saul died. The end eventually came. The end eventually will come. The end comes for every man here on earth. Even Enoch and Elijah experienced the end. Even though they went without dying. But since the time of Adam, the end of every man has always come. Some, a triumphant end. Other people, a tragic end. Neighbors around us live and labor. Labors around us work and fight. As if life will never end. While there are just a few hours to the end, you look at Saul here, he knew the end was coming. But he did prepare. And how many of us know that the end is coming? And what preparation do we make? And it must carry on waging war against some enemies, physical, tangible, visible, physical. And Saul continued waging war against the Philistines when he should have stopped and waged the final war against sin, against self, and against Satan. And many people in the world, even when they're very close to the very end of their lives here on earth, they keep on fighting the old war. And even when they know they're going to fail, they're going to fall, they're going to die, they still keep on fighting, never thinking about eternity. Though Saul lost the kingdom, he could have prevented the loss of his soul. He was fighting for the crown. He kept the crown. Because the man that came later to David to say, I saw him when he died, and I took this crown to show you that I took his life. Although he was a psychophant, but he had the crown in his hand. Saul kept the crown at the price of his soul. What are we trying to keep? A job, prestige, a crown, a promotion, some things here on earth, and yet many people are not thinking about their own soul. We're looking at Mark chapter 8 and I'm reading here from verse 36 and verse 37 Mark 8 we're looking at verse 36 for what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul it's a time for us to think and think through and think about our lives, and think about the things we're running after. And we're not thinking about the time of the end. And the Lord Jesus Christ has reminded us, what shall it profit you? If you gain the crown, 
if you gauge the position, if you kept the royalty, if you kept anything, and then you lost your soul, what shall a man or what will you give in exchange for your soul? In First Chronicles chapter 10, here we're reading from verse 13, First Chronicles chapter 10, and I'm reading from verse 13. It says in verse 13, So Saul died for his transgression, which he had committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord, which he kept not, also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit and inquired of it. I'm sure you know the story. We learned that just a few weeks ago. But think about that story. He went to the witch of Endor. He wanted to know, I'm going to the battlefield. Will I come back safe and sound, alive? Will I win the victory? And the message came to him that he was going to die in the battle. He became so distressed, he will not eat. Eventually, they prevailed on him and he ate. But think about this. If you were, and you were to go on a journey, and you knew that your life was not right, and you knew that end, the end might come as you're going on the way, what would be the best thing to do? There are some people that will act like Saul. I must be there. They're expecting me there. Even though I know there might be danger in the way. If I'm not there to preach, what will people think? If I'm not there to sing, what will people think? If I'm not there to officiate, what will people think? If I'm not there to do my duty, what will people think? Now Saul, you don't have to be there. They could wage the war without you. There was a time when, so, when David sent people to the battlefield and then he was taken back at home. Not only that, we know that Saul, when he was going to be chosen to be king, they, was, they were looking for him. He went to hide himself somewhere. Saul, what would have been the path of wisdom at this time? That you know that you are not ready to face God in eternity. You are not ready to pass on to the other side of eternity. And you know that if you went this time, you would die. Not that you might, you will die. Why don't you stay back and see how to settle this with God? Now God did not say he would not restore him. He will not restore him to the kingship, to the, uh, to the royalty. He will not restore him uh, to be the king because he, has re he had rejected him from there. But you know, Ahab, when Elijah came to Ahab and said, and then Ahab said, have you found me my enemy? He said, yes, I found you. You sold yourself to doing evil. And then judgment is coming and he laid it on him. We're told that Ahab went softly. And God said, Elijah, see the man is walking softly. And he said, because of this humility and repentance, I'm not going to bring this at his time. This man Saul could have also done that. He could have saw the face of the Lord. He could have left that war at that time, that battle at that time. And he could have said, I see, I need to settle with God. But there are people that will go and fight him. There are people that will go on waging the war. There are people that will go on officiating, even though they know that Christ might come anytime, they might die anytime. But in the case of Saul, that's what he did. And then it says in verse 14, And he inquired not of the Lord. Therefore, he slew him and turned the kingdom unto David, Jesus, uh, the son of Jesse. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 27. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. As it is appointed unto men wants to die, what follows? But after this, the judgment. After this, the judgment. As we learned about the tragic um, death of Saul. 
there's a solemn warning for every one of us and the warning you find in proverbs chapter 29 i'm reading from verse 1 proverbs chapter 29 and we're looking at verse 1 proverbs chapter 29 reading from verse 1 here it says in verse 1 he that being often reproved had neath his neck shall suddenly be destroyed and that tell me without remedy we're going to read that together one two three go he that being often reproved had neath his neck you think about Saul how many times rebuke came how many times correction came how many times instruction came how many times Samuel told him this is not right you have not acted right you have acted foolishly why did you do this I feared the people because of my fear of the people that's why I did that and then the Lord sent him again to do another thing and he went and instead of doing the right thing again he did the wrong thing and uh, someone said what have you done this he said I've obeyed the word of the Lord and then someone said about the bleating of the sheep I am hearing oh he said I have explanation for that often and often he was reproved and the Bible says he a man could be a woman too could be a leader could be a preacher could be a pastor could be a worker he that being often reproved had neath his neck shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy a time comes in the life of a man a time comes in the life of a woman when it goes on and on and on and it goes beyond the deadline. The deadline. I'm sure you know about the deadline. You're given an assignment to the office. You're given an assignment in your place of work. You're given an assignment to a college or university. And you're told that this is the deadline. And you want to make sure you meet up with that deadline. If you don't meet up with that deadline, eventually, even if you turn your papers in, it's rejected. God has a deadline. And you don't want to cross that deadline. That's why I'm talking to you tonight on the tragedy of crossing God's deadline. It happened to Saul. It could happen to anybody. The tragedy of crossing God's deadline. A line is drawn. And then you want to make sure that you repent before you get to that line. You are restored before you get to that line. You are saved before you get to that line. And your life is transformed before you get to that line. You prepare for eternity before you get to that deadline. Because there's tr tragedy and there is evil. There's danger. There is judgment that awaits the man, awaits the woman. If he crosses that deadline and is not saved. He crosses that deadline and is not restored. He crosses that deadline and is a backslider. The tragedy of crossing God's deadline. There are three things we're going to look at. As we look at that verse, 20, verse 1 of Proverbs chapter 29. Are you still there? He that being often reproved had neath a snake. That's one part. How does it happen to somebody that even though he's reproved often and often, is corrected often and often, he hardens a snake, he hardens his heart, he hardens his spirit, he stiffens a snake, and he does not bend. He says, Yes, I hear what you say. I read what you open, and I can understand what you are driving at. I see it's the word of God, but all the same is not going to be corrected. He hardens a snake. Point one there. Number two, shall suddenly be destroyed. It's happened to other people. But the problem with human beings is, that cannot happen to me. I'm special. I'm different. 
It may happen to Saul. No, it will not happen to me. It can happen to you. It can happen to anyone. It's happened to thousands and millions of people on earth. They lost their lives and they went into eternity without preparation. Because it says, shall suddenly be destroyed. Part number three, and that without remedy. That without remedy. Three things. Number one, the stubborn defiance of an impenitent hardened soul. The stubborn defiance of an impenitent hardened soul is often reproved, and yet he hardens his neck. Is often reproved, and yet he will not take correction. Point number two the sudden destruction of an incorrigible hardened sinner. The sudden destruction. Of an incorrigible hardened sinner. That's what it says there in the middle part. It says, shall suddenly be destroyed. Point number three, the settled destiny of an impudent hardened scorner. The settled destiny of an impudent hardened scorner. It says, and that without Remedy. We're coming to point number one. Tell me number one there. Tell me with the voice of a preacher. Tell me as if you're reading it from your own notes. The stubborn defiance of an impenitent, hardened soul. If you're hardened, you'll not be the first person to be hardened since the time of Adam. If you're impenitent, you'll not be the first person to be impenitent, to be unrepentant since the time of Pharaoh. If you're impenitent and incorrigible, you'll not be the first person to harden yourself. But the danger is that as you continue like that, and you will not hear correction, and you will not listen to correction, and you will not abide in the watch of God, there is danger. The danger that faces an impenitent, an unrepentant, hardened soul, hardened sinner. Come back now to that Proverbs chapter 29 verse 1. He that being often reproved, hardness his neck. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 6. 1 Samuel chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 6. Hardness of heart. Being incorrigible. Being unrepentant and being impenitent, it happens. You want to make sure it doesn't happen to you. You want to make sure that you drop all activities when there is sin. And when there is condemnation, when there is conviction. And when the Lord is telling you by spirit that if you continue this way, if you die this way, there's no assurance of heaven. And you will not meet the Lord at peace. That's the time to stop everything and stop all the walking, all the ushering, and all the serving. And everything you think is so important that we must find you there. Arrest yourself and stop everything and say, I need to settle with the Lord. It's not so important to walk, walk, and walk until you perish. You must take care of your soul and take care of your destiny. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 6, verse 6. It says, wherefore then do ye harden your hearts? As the Egyptians and, the, and Pharaoh hardened their hearts, when he had wrought wonderfully among them, did they not let the people go and they departed? It says, we must be aware of hardening ourselves. You must be aware of hardening your own heart, your own conscience, having a seared conscience, hearing the word of God, and not being moved by the word of God. There is danger there. In 2 Kings chapter 17, I'm reading from verse 13. 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 13. It says, yet the Lord testified against Israel. And against Judah, by all the prophets, and by all the seers, saying, Turn ye from your evil ways. They were often reproved. Prophets came and spoke to them. Seers came and spoke to them. 
the servants of the Lord came and spoke to them. Preachers came and spoke to them. They told them with one voice at different times, in different places, in different ways. They told them, turn yourselves from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes according to all the law which I commanded your fathers and which I sent to you by my prophets, by my servants, the prophets. Look at verse 14. Notwithstanding, notwithstanding, they would not hear. You've heard about repentance, notwithstanding, they will not hear. You've heard about salvation, notwithstanding, they will not hear. You've heard about without holiness, no man shall say the Lord, notwithstanding, they will not hear. You've heard about having pure hands, pure hearts and clean hands, notwithstanding, they will not hear. You've heard about remembered Lord's wife, notwithstanding, they will not hear. The sadness of heart, often reproach, often spoken to, and yet they will not listen. It says, notwithstanding, they will not hear, but hardened their necks like the neck of their fathers that did not believe in the Lord their God. And they rejected his statutes. You see that? They rejected his statutes. And it's a covenant that he made with their fathers. And his testimonies, which he testified against them. And they followed. What did they follow? Tell me out loud vanity and they became vain when you leave the real sin when you leave the essential sin when you leave the indispensable sin when you leave the salvation of your soul the security of your soul and when you leave that assurance that you ought to have and then you're following after other things you're busy about nothing and you're busy about this and that except the important thing then you're following vanity and it says they became vain they followed vanity and then they became vain because the lord had charged them that this is what they should not do but then they continued i pray that a change will come in jesus name I'm looking at Jeremiah chapter 7. Jeremiah, we're looking at chapter 7. Stubborn, defiance of an impenitent, hardened soul. In uh, Jeremiah chapter 7, I'm reading here from verse 23. But this sin commanded I them, saying, Obey my voice. The Lord was talking to them as his own children. The Lord was talking to them as the people of covenant, as the people that he got out, out of the land of Egypt. They were going through the wilderness. They were going to the land of promise, a land flowing with milk and honey. He was talking to them as a people that was gracious to. He was faithful unto them because he had promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that this is what I'll give you. And he did that. And now he sent the prophets to them and he said, Obey my voice and I will be your God. And ye shall be my people, and walk ye in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may go well, it may be well with you. Verse 24, but, tell me, they hearkened not. But we're not just talking about them, we're talking about you. We're talking about ourselves. How many messages have we heard? How many instructions have we had? How many corrections have we had? How many times have the Lord spoken to us and he said, repentance is important. Restoration is important. Righteousness is important. It is important that we follow the Lord and we follow the word of the Lord, not just to preach and not just to minister, but to make sure that what we're telling other people, we ourselves, we're following. It says, but they hearkened not, nor inclined their ear, but walked in the counsels and in the imagination of their evil heart and went backward and not forward. Look at verse 25. Since the days of your since the day of your fathers came forth, that they came forth out of the land of Egypt until this day, I've even said unto you, all my servants, the prophets, daily rising and early and sending them. Yet, verse 26. They hearkened not unto me, nor inclined their ear. But what did they do? They hardened their neck. They did worse than their fathers. Now, as you uh, read that word in Proverbs, 
chapter 29 when it says he that being often reproved the question is how does he reprove us how does he instruct us how does he correct us how does he bring us under conviction number one by the holy spirit when the spirit is calm he will guide you into all truth he will convict the world of sin number two by his prophets and servants by the preachers by the leaders by the people who read the bible the word of god to us by the people who are courageous enough to look at us face to face and challenge us and say my friend is that right neighbor is that good wife is this righteous husband is this the way we're being taught members is this right by god's servants and by the prophets by the preachers who are bold enough to confront us to say that sin is evil anywhere you find it and by that way we're being reproved number three by the reaching word when you look at the word yourself and you read the bible the Lord correcting us and reproving us and saying, This is the way what he therein. Number four, by the voice of conscience. How many times our conscience will prick us and say, Friend, this cannot be right. This is not the right way. And then to harden your conscience will come to that. How people harden their consciences. How people harden their hearts. Even though all these avenues are taken by the Lord. As he speaks to us. Number one, by the Holy Spirit. Number two, by the prophets and the servants. Number three, by the reaching word. Number four, by the voice of conscience. Number five, by parents and friends. Their parents, those who are still uh, kind of bold to talk to their children, and they talk to their children. And spiritual parents, those who are bold enough, coordinators and group coordinators and regional overseers and state overseers and pastors, those who are still bold enough to say, uh-uh, this is not right. This is evil. If you continue this way, this will lead to perdition. It will lead to condemnation. It will lead to damnation. And then number six, by the judgments of others. When you see the judgment coming upon other people, sometimes an accident that happens to somebody. And then you say, what if that had happened to me? Who would I be? All these things I'm sweeping under the carpet. All these things that I'm not settling. What if I died suddenly? Like that other person died that I read about. What will happen to me? By the judgments on others. Number seven. By providence and circumstances. Some circumstances will come. And then will cross your way. And the Lord will say, look at this. What if this one resulted into the final call? That you leave this world. And then you're in the great beyond. What will happen unto you and that is the rebuke we have been having you'll not say the lord had not corrected you in your, in your corner of your heart in the corner of your mind and then your conscience over there privately is me speaking to you but he says he that being often reproved hardness a snake how do people harden their hearts you know if clay is exposed to the sun continually the sun will harden the clay just leave the clay outside there, it will harden. Or if you make, uh, you know, some cement and you leave it in the sun, eventually it will become as hard as a stone, maybe even harder than a stone. How do people then harden themselves? Number one, by repeated procrastination. Lord, I hear you. I'll think about that. Lord, I hear you. I'll correct that in the future. Lord, I hear you. I can't correct it now. If I corrected it now, some people are looking at me. And then they will say, uh-huh, that message got him. Uh-huh, that message got her. So I'm going to act as if I didn't hear anything. I'll keep on doing what I'm doing. I'm going to procrastinate. I'm going to push it forward so that people will not know I'm repenting just because of what has been said. Number one, by repeated procrastination. When you pro procrastinate now, you push it forward now. Another day, push it forward. Not today. Another day, push it forward again. Your heart will be gradually hardened. We're looking in Acts of the Apostles chapter 24. And I'm reading from verse 25. Acts chapter 24. 
And I'm reading from verse 25. It says, And as he reasoned of righteousness and temperance and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. I hear you about righteousness. I hear you, Paul, about temperance, self-control. I hear you, Paul, about the judgment to come. He trembled. It was like he was under conviction, but he must procrastinate. That to, that's how to harden the heart. That's the beginning of people hardening their hearts. Number two, by diversions and amusements diversions and amusements you hear something serious it strikes you it cuts you it pinches you and it uh, it's very pungent in your life and then you are very sorrowful and as you are sorrowful you want to drive away that sorrow and it's a conviction for sin it is a sorrow for evil things that you have done but you want to have diversions and amusements that will make the conviction to be washed away and then you don't care for that thing again or sometimes you have had the word of god you're very sorrowful and the lord is saying i have something against you this is not right your life is going down the drain you're not living right and look at the carelessness look at the sinfulness and look at the dirty things you're doing look at your private life and then when that sorrow comes then you turn on music that's diversion you turn on something entertaining that's diversion you turn on something that will relieve you of the pain of conviction the agony of conviction that's what's called diversion and amusement we're looking at uh, mark chapter 4 in mark chapter 4 i'm reading from verse 19 mark chapter 4 verse 19 it says that the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things entering in choke the world and becomes unfruitful it chokes the world it chokes the conviction the thing that ought to convict you and drive you on your knees those diversions and amusements and those uh, kind of games that will turn your heart away from serious matters that will make you little by little your heart near your hearts number three by levity what's levity treating serious matters without the seriousness it demands treating serious messengers without the seriousness it demands somebody comes to you and is very serious about what he's talking to you about and is saying you know it's taking me some courage to come to you to talk to you about this matter i was thinking about the way you'll take it i but eventually i saw that well even if you are going to strike me or you are going to slap me or whatever i decided i must tell you it's okay what is that and then he says uh, well it's a serious matter we need to sit down because uh, this uh, i see that if this goes on in your life it's going to be terrible i don't want you to have your blood on my hand what if you died in day condition that's why i'm talking to you like this and then the major sit down and then he opens his mouth he tells you he says this and this and this and that and the first thing you laugh and you laugh and, and, and you're doing that deliberately you know that what the man is saying is right you know that what your wife is saying is right and you know that this is a serious matter but you're turning to levity and then you laugh you say that's what you came for that's why you are so serious as if heavens are falling down. I thought you even came to say, uh, you know, something very serious. My friend, yes, it's serious. I've been praying about this. In fact, I shouldn't have told you I fasted about this because I saw that there is danger in front of you. Then you start laughing. You mean you went on hunger strike? you mean you went too fast and you punish yourself to come and tell me something? Come on now, get serious. Get bothered about important thing. This one, this is a little thing. What are you counting serious about this? Levity. And as you continue like that, as you practice that, and you shrug it off, and you wave it off, your heart is getting hardened little by little by little. We're looking at Genesis chapter 19. In Genesis chapter 19, I'm reading from verse 14. Genesis 
chapter 19 we're looking at uh, verse 14 and lot went out and he spake unto his sons in law which married his daughters and said ah get you out of this place for the lord will destroy this city for the Lord, it was serious. It was coming from the presence of two angels. And these two angels have showed him, and the end has come for Sodom and Gomorrah. If you have anybody here, leave every other scene. This is urgent assignment. And go tell them that destruction has come. The fire is going to be rained down upon Sodom and Gomorrah. And then Lot went out with that seriousness. He wanted to deliver the message from those two angels. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons in law. And he took it with levity. This is what you came for, Uncle Lord. This is what you have come to tell us. You have not come to visit us for some time. When you know the other uh, lady uh, got uh, delivered, he didn't even come. And we thought you were coming to make for you know, your absence. At this other time, you didn't come. We thought you were going to come now. And then tell us something. Then let's have some time together and have some entertainment. That's what you came for. They took it with levity. And there are people that do like that. They hear the word of God. And when they hear the word of God, they're born like fire. They hear the word of God that pinches and pierces like a sword. Then they turn everything to, uh, to levity and they amuse themselves about it. And then they go to do some other things and the conviction wears away. Number four, by deliberate plan, habitual disobedience. Deliberate plan, habitual disobedience. You know what some people do? They say, well, show Jeremiah that, you know, his word is not that weighty. Well, show Jeremiah that his word is not that very important to us. Well, show him, because, you know, if he comes like that, and then he tells you something, and then you obey, that will encourage him, that will push him to come again and be telling you this kind of thing, and to shut him up. You know what you do? Deliberately, habitually, you disobey that so that he'll be so discouraged, he'll not come again because he knows we're not going to listen to him. Jeremiah chapter 44. In Jeremiah chapter 44, I'm reading from verse 16. Jeremiah chapter 44, verse 16. As for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, Jeremiah, listen to us, we will not hearken unto thee. Deliberate habitual as for the word that you have spoken to us in the name of the lord he didn't come in his name he came in the name of the lord he came to tell them this is the watch of the lord and it was burning in his heart and they allowed him to finish and when he finished they said thank you very much jeremiah but I want to tell you we understand we understand that's your business that's your full-time work you're always in the presence of the lord we know you are coming from the presence of the lord but listen to this as for the word you have spoken to us in the name of the Lord. We will not hack in unto you. Look at verse 17. But we will certainly do whatsoever sin goeth forth out of our own mouth. Whatever we decide to do, we're the master of our faith or the captain of our soul. We're going to do that. That's deliberate, planned, habitual disobedience. Number five, by proudly turning the heart away. Proudly turning the heart away. It's on top of the world. It's on top of the preachers. It's on top of the doctrine. It's on top of any rebuke. It's on top of any reproof. And then proudly turns away from the word of the prophet. We're looking at Nehemiah chapter 9 verse 29. Nehemiah chapter 9. This is the process of hardening the heart. Hardening the heart. Hardening the conscience and stiffening the neck until there will be no remedy. Nehemiah chapter 9 and reading from verse 29. Yeah, it tells us about uh, these people who had hardened themselves. It says and testified against them that they that thou mightest bring them again unto thy law. The reason why the Lord sent the prophets to them, the preachers to them, the seers to them, the servants of the Lord to them is so that he might bring them once again. 
But actually, Lord, and the reason why the Lord is sending all these messages to us, I'm sure you understand, is to bring us back to the beginning, bring us back to original love, and bring us back to our first love, and bring us back to our first consecration, bring us back to our first faith, and bring us back to our first conviction, conviction in the word of God, and bring us back to the good old days. That's why I testify against them, that thou mightest bring them again unto thy law. Yet they dealt proudly and hearkened not unto thy commandments, but they sinned against thy judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them, and withdrew their shoulder and hardened their neck and would not hear. You see, that's the process of hardening. The people who hardened themselves against the watch of the Lord. Number six, by scornful rejection. By scornful rejection, you reject and despise. You reject and belittle. You reject and look down. You reject and say, who is that? You reject and then you, you act as if you are taller, you are greater, you are wiser, and you are more intelligent. And then even though the man is coming from the presence of God, and he says, hear the watch of the Lord, you scornfully reject what is saying. Hardness of heart is on the way. And it's about to fully harden. We're looking at Luke chapter 7 verse 30. Luke chapter 7. Reading from verse 30. Here it tells us in verse 30. Verse 30 says, And the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves against themselves being not baptized of him and then number seven there's a final step divine abandonment when god says that's all right that's enough you've crossed the divine deadline divine abandonment in romans chapter one romans chapter one Reading from verse 24. Romans chapter 1 verse 24. Wherefore God also gave them up. You don't want to hear? Alright. You can go your way. You don't want to take correction? That's alright. I leave you alone. Leave me alone God. This is too much. Alright. I've listened to you. I've heard you. I leave you alone. Allow me to go my way. Thank you. I've heard I allow you to go your way. You cross that deadline when he doesn't talk to you anymore. It says, wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Look at verse 26. For this cause God gave them up to vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Men and women, God gave them up. Verse 28, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Now you see the possibility of hardening the heart. You see the process of hardening the heart. Number one, when the person procrastinates repeatedly. Repent today. I'll think about it. Maybe I'll do it tomorrow. Pharaoh, all these frogs are there. And then you called Moses. You said, please, plead with, for the Lord. Plead with the Lord on my behalf that you'll take all these frogs away. And Moses said, yes, I'll do that. He'll take the frogs away. When do you want me to tell God to take the frogs away? What did Pharaoh say? What did Pharaoh say? Tomorrow. He wants to still be with the frogs today. He wants it to be removed tomorrow. And there are many people like Pharaoh. They don't want all those sins to be removed today. All those sins to go away today. They want the repentance today. They don't want the turning around today. Procrastination. 
and then diversions repeated repeated procrastinations and diversions and amusements i don't know what a person who is uh, not sure of heaven who is not sure of forgiveness who is not sure of salvation who is not sure of uh, seeing the face of the lord who is not sure if the lord came today whether i will see the lord or not i don't know what he's doing with amusement and with games and with something that will divert his attention from spiritual things or levity Levity, joking and jesting and turning everything to laughter, turning everything to play, not turning everything to entertainment. That, that's a terrible thing. They're fighting conviction and they're pushing away conviction by that kind of levity or by deliberately planned habitual disobedience. Yes, we heard. Yes, I saw it in myself in the word of God. But as for the word we are spoken from the face of the Lord and from the presence of the Lord, we will not hacking unto you or by proudly turning away the heart from the Lord or by scornful rejection and then eventually there's divine abandonment. I pray before it's too late, every one of us will come to the very presence of God in Jesus' name. I need an amen from the house. Amen. Point number two now is a sudden destruction of an incorrigible hardened sinner. The sudden destruction. We're coming back to Proverbs chapter 29. Proverbs chapter 29. I'm reading from verse 1. Proverbs chapter 29 verse 1. He that being of all reproved, had neath his neck, this is the next part now, shall suddenly be destroyed. Shall suddenly be destroyed. That word sudden means abrupt. It's unanticipated. It's unexpected. It's unforeseen. Unprepared is unprepared to leave. Instant removal without a chance to say, give me a moment to get ready for eternity. That's what happened to Saul. He went headlong to the battlefield and then the archers hit him. He knew he was dying, but no time to repent. He was going to lost eternity. He was going to perdition. It happened suddenly. A sudden departure. Never to return. And yet, no not ready. And it says, He that being often reproved, had neck his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed. That means uh, here, not, not set, he has not set his house in order. In eternity, he has not settled on the other side. There's no salvation, and yet he's going. There's no forgiveness, and yet he has to leave. And there is uh, no clear testimony, and yet he has to depart. There's no light, there's no promise. Suddenly it happens, he's gone. Without settling his account with God, his account with men, he's gone. How many people, you know, when they're sick, and we're talking about healing, but healing is not coming immediately. Even if you are going to get healed, set you over the Lord. That's even going to help your prayer. That's going to help your communication with heaven. That's going to help your supplication. If you're sick, anytime you're sick, the first thing to do is to make sure that there's no iniquity in your heart. Because it says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. But if thou shalt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord your God and do all that he has commanded you, then he says, I'll put none of these diseases upon you which are brought upon the Egyptians. I am the Lord that healeth you. And so when you're sick, the first thing to do is to check your life. Am I all right? Should, if I died now, will I make it to heaven? And then when you settle all that, then you come back to the Lord and say, Lord, wouldn't you heal me? Then you claim the promises of God. But healing, healing, healing. There's a kind of sickness that will be the final sickness somebody will have before he dies. And you must make sure that you are ready to meet the Lord when he comes. Otherwise, you'll be like Saul, the sudden death of an incorrigible, hardened sinner. And look at Proverbs chapter, Proverbs chapter 6. Suddenly, they are gone. And then we cannot account for them. Even though you are saying something at the, you know, the burial ground, you really don't understand what you are saying. In Proverbs chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 14. Forwardness in his heart, he divides forwardness is in his heart he devises mischief continually he sows discord therefore shall his calamity come how 
Tell me out loud. Suddenly, suddenly shall he be broken without remedy. You see that it's in the scriptures. It happens to people. The people that die suddenly. The people that leave suddenly. And there's no chance for them to repent. There's no chance for them to return. That's why it says today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. As in the day of provocation, when they hardened their hearts. In Proverbs chapter 24. Proverbs chapter 24, I'm reading from verse 22. The calamity shall rise suddenly, and who knows the ruin of them both. It says the people that just go on and on and on in sin, in rebellion, in disobedience, in stubborn defiance, eventually the end will come, and it comes suddenly. You know, if you've been, uh, you know, walking a particular, every time you hear the word of God, it's been happening for years years now you hear that word and even though you see some things you ought to correct or you always push it forward it's like hardening your heart it's like then you go out and then you are maybe joking and jesting and talking about this and talking about that and then there's no seriousness to help you and lead you towards through that repentance and it happens every day every week every month how do you know it's going to change except you arrest yourself except you pick up yourself except you say uh -uh, this must stop what kind of personality am i becoming what kind of a christian am i becoming and what kind of a leader am i becoming and what kind of spiritual life am i projecting you stop and you turn around so that there will be no sudden destruction we're looking at ecclesiastes, ecclesiastes chapter 9 Ecclesiastes chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 12. It says, For man also knoweth not his time, knoweth not his time. Saul even knew, Saul had an idea that as we're going tomorrow to the battlefield, that she's going, that's going to be the end. Because you have not obeyed the word of the Lord. And that man should have stayed back, and that man should have checked himself, and should have said, am I ready to die? Am I ready to go on? Am I ready to go like, you know, I'm the king of Israel, and I'm going to fight this battle? When I know that tomorrow I'll be forgotten and buried, where will I spend eternity? But most people do not know their time, even though he knew his own time, for man also knoweth not his time, as the fishes that are taken in an evil net, and as the birds that are caught in the snare, so are the sons of men snared in an evil time, when it falleth, what's the next word there? Suddenly upon them. It falleth suddenly upon them. And that's the reason why we also need to go out and reach out to these people. The people, we saw them yesterday. We can't see them today again. We saw them last week. They are gone today. We need to tell them that the end can come at any time. They need to get ready. We're looking at Psalm 78. I'm reading from verse 13. Psalm 78. We're reading from verse 13. It says in verse 30, they were not estranged from their lost, but while the meat was yet in their mouths, the wrath of God came upon them and slew the, fast, the fattest of them and smote down the chosen men of Israel. You see that uh, they wanted something and they wanted it so badly and they grumbled and they fought and they ch chided uh, with Moses and did everything until eventually God said, okay, that's what you want food that's what you want meat okay get it and they got it while it was still yet in their mouth then the lord struck them suddenly they perished i pray it will not happen to us but then it is today when the word is still coming and when you're still active, when you still have your mind, you still have your brain. Before maybe something happens, you can't remember things anymore. Something happens, you're dull. Something happens, people are talking. You don't even know the people talking. Something is, you know, something happens and uh, you cannot recollect anything. But when you still have your brain and your mind, when you can still tell, yes, that happened yesterday. That happened last week. That happened last month. I knew 
need to correct this now while you're still awake that's the time to say oh lord i'm coming back to you i'm seeking the face of the lord when you're still having your heart you're still having your mind you're still having your understanding you're still having your recollection and you can still say oh lord have mercy on me when you still know the promises of god and when you can still hold on to those promises and say lord i want you to forgive me i want you to change my life i want you to restore me when you can still talk to the lord with assurance and with confidence and with faith and you can say if i call upon the name of the lord i know the promise of the lord i know it will save me i know it will restore me that's the time to pray you seek the lord while he may be found and you call upon him while he's near let the wicked forsake his way and the righteous man is sought and let him return and turn to the lord again for god will pardon abundantly pardon but it's a time that it becomes too late that even if you were seeking at that time your chance is gone you've crossed the line this time when you're still sure of the mercy of god of the grace of god of the promises of god that's going to call in uh, zechariah chapter 7 zechariah chapter 7 I'm, I'm reading from verse 11 zechariah chapter 7 verse 11 it says but they refuse to hack him and they pulled away the shoulder and they stopped their ears that they should not hear the word of repentance came uh -uh. they refused to hear and they pulled away their shoulder and they stopped their ears that they should not hear the word of restoration and the word of holiness without which no man shall say the lord and the word that calls her to sanctification it comes to them instead of seeking the face of the lord and consecrating so that they will be who god wants them to be it says they refuse to hack him and they pulled away the shoulder and they stopped their ears that they should not hear yea they made their hearts as an adamant stone they did that themselves they said no we're not going to hear we're going to hide in our hearts lest they should hear the law and the words which the lord of hosts has said in his spirit by the former prophets therefore came a great wrath from the lord of hosts verse 13 therefore it is come to pass that as he cried and they would not hear so they cried and i would not hear says the lord of hosts you see there are people that had in themselves to so the point god says okay i've been speaking to you and you will not hear all right i leave you to yourself and then you cry unto him he says what are you calling me i call you you'll not answer so you are calling me you want me to answer what kind of transaction is that what kind of deal is that i spoke to you you said you don't have time for me now you are talking to me you want me to have time for you that's why we're told in first thessalonians chapter 5 first thessalonians chapter 5 and we're looking at verse 3 first thessalonians chapter 5 we're looking at here from verse 3 it says in verse 3 for when they shall say peace and safety then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman or child and they shall not escape and they shall not escape and that's the reason why while he's calling you and while the message is still uh, touching you and pinching you and is drawing you to calvary and drawing you to the lord that's the time to say yes lord i hear you yes lord i understand you're speaking to me yes lord i'm going to obey and then good grace will come to you as you obey in jesus name are you still there i said grace will come in jesus name we're looking at proverbs chapter one proverbs chapter one i'm reading from verse i'm reading from verse uh, 22 how long you simple ones will you love simplicity and the scorners delight in their scorning and fools hate knowledge turn you at my reproach. behold i will pour my spirit unto you and i will make known my words unto you what the lord is still saying i have a promise for you i'll restore you 
I'll forgive you. I'll grant you grace. I'll grant you a tender heart. I'll grant you, uh, you know, the experience you're seeking for. I'll make a way for you in heaven. We're still communicating with you. That's the time to go to him and fall on your knees and say, Oh Lord, I'm going to listen. Look at verse 24. Because I have called and you refused. I've stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But ye have set at naught all my counsel and would none of my reproof. I also so will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh, when your fear cometh as desolation, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind. When distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, and I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For that, for that, they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. They despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them. And the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But look at verse 33. But who so hackness? But who so hackneth, the one that hears the word of God, repent and they repent. The one that hears the word of God, come back to the Lord and they come back to the Lord. The one that hears the word of the Lord, that says, seek the Lord so that you'll find him today. And they seek the face of the Lord. But who so hackneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from the fear of evil. And somebody would say, Amen. Amen. Point number three now. The settled destiny of an impudent hardened scorner. We're looking at Proverbs chapter 29. Proverbs chapter 29. I'm reading from verse 1. He that being often reproved had neath his neck shall suddenly be destroyed. Tell me the rest. And that without remedy. And that without remedy. A time comes in the life of a man, in the time, in the life of a woman, when he crosses the deadline. And God says, that's enough. Come back home. And then you cannot continue anymore. And then the fellow is gone. Suddenly, it's gone. Suddenly, it's called to the great beyond. And that without remedy. Proverbs chapter 6 again. Proverbs chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 15. Proverbs chapter 6 verse 15. Therefore shall his calamity come suddenly. Suddenly it shall be broken without remedy. Suddenly it shall be broken without remedy. In Second Chronicles chapter 36. Second Chronicles chapter 36. We're reading from verse 15. It says in verse 15, And the Lord God of their father said to them, By his messengers, rising up betimes and sending, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. And, but they mocked the messengers of God. They mocked the messengers of God. They've been doing that for centuries. When the word comes, they don't want to hear. When rebuke comes, they don't want to hear. When something comes with conviction, they've been doing that for millennia. It says, they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against the people till, tell me, there was no remedy. Until there was no remedy. Proverbs, again, chapter 15. In Proverbs chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 10. Proverbs chapter 15, reading from verse 10. It says in verse 10, correction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way. And yet he has to come back to the way if he's going to get to heaven. 
And there's only one to there's only one way to bring him back to the way of heaven is by correction. And yet, because he's gone astray, his conscience talks to him. He says, Oh, hold on, my conscience. I'm the master of my conscience. Keep quiet. And then the conscience keeps quiet. And then he wants to do the same thing to the prophets of God and to the preachers of the truth. He wants to tell them, shut up, keep quiet. And we say, No, we cannot shut up because your soul is precious. And the Lord has sent us to come and warn you and to tell you that if you continue like this you are going to perish eventually but correction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way and he that hateth reproof shall die because there's only one way to come back to the lord and is to accept rebuke is to appreciate rebuke and is to repent and turn as a result of the rebuke but the thing that will bring him back to the lord he hates that and the word of god says he'll perish he'll die and suddenly it will happen unto him we're looking at daniel chapter 5 daniel chapter 5 i'm reading here from verse 20 daniel chapter 5 and we're reading from verse 20. In verse 20, this is what he tells us in verse 20. But when his heart was lifted up and his mind hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne and they took his glory from him. And he was driven from the sons of men and his heart was made like the bees and his dwelling was with the wild asses. They fed him with grass like oxen and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till he knew that the most high God ruled in the kingdom of men and that he appointed over it whomsoever he will and thou his son. O Belshazzar as uh, not humble thine heart, though thou knewest all these, but as lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of his house before thee, and thou and thy lords and thy wives and thy concubines have drunk wine in them, and thou hast praised the gods of silver and of gold and of brass, iron, wood, and stone, I which see not, nor hear, nor know, and the God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways, hast thou not glorified? Then was the part of the hand sent from him, and this writing was written, and this is the writing that was written, many, many take you for sin. This is the interpretation of the sin. Many, God has numbered thy kingdom and finished it. The time of the end was coming for the man. No chance again because it's gone, it's crossed that deadline we're talking about. God's deadline. And then it goes on to say, take care, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Weigh your own life. Look at your own life. Examine yourself. Are you still in the faith? Or are you found wanting? Paris, the kingdom is divided and is given to the medicine and the passions. Look at Vastachi. In that night was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, what? Slain. Then came without being ready for heaven without being ready for eternity we're looking at isaiah chapter 48 isaiah chapter 48 and i'm reading from verse 2 isaiah chapter 48 verse 2 for they call themselves of the holy city and they stay themselves upon the god of israel and the lord of hosts is his name have declared the former things from the beginning and they went forth out of my mouth and i showed them i did i did them uh, and it says i did them suddenly and it came to pass because i knew that thou art obstinate disobedient rebellious had hearted. I knew that thou wert obstinate, and thy neck is as an iron sinew, and thy brow as brass. And the Lord was saying in verse 18, look at verse 18, it says, Oh, that thou art hearkened to my commandments, then at thy peace being as a river, and thy righteousness as the waves of the sea. The Lord said, I could have saved you. 
I could have given you peace. There could have been a great turning around. You could have gone to heaven. And the same thing we can say about Saul. But he crossed the deadline. He sinned against the light. He protected the crown without preserving his own conversion. Seeking honor was more important to him than securing holiness. He was crowned on earth but condemned to hell. Not wanting shame on earth, he told that uh, man, the armor bearer, he said, thrust me through, kill me, so that the uncircumcised will not kill me, and then I will not, uh, you know, be ashamed. And the armor bearer refused that, so he killed himself. He drove himself to shame, sorrow, suffering forever in hellfire. There's a line that is drawn by rejecting the Lord. Where the call of his spirit is lost. And you hurry along with the pleasure mark throng. And the question is, have you counted? Have you counted the cost? Activity upon activity. But your soul is not right with God. And uh, this ministry and another ministry. But if you die today, you're not sure that you'll get to heaven. And if that's you, you may batter your hope of eternity's morn for a moment of joy or pleasure at the most, for the glitter of sin and the things it will win. But the question is, before you go out from here today, are you counting the cost? Have you counted the cost? While the door of his mercy is open to you, before the depths of his love you exhaust, won't you come? Won't you pray? Won't you be restored? And won't you yield? Won't you whisper, oh Lord, I yield. I have counted. I have counted the cost. Have you really counted the cost? Meeting after meeting. Message after message. Conference after conference. All these good things that are coming from the word of God and coming to us. Has it made any change? Any transformation? Have you stopped and you have said there is a deadline? I don't want to cross that deadline. Have you counted the cause? If your soul should be lost, even now, it may be that the line you are crossing. Have you counted? Have you counted the cost? Let's go to the Lord in prayer today and say, Lord, you want to be serious with yourself. You want to be serious with the call of God upon your soul. You don't want to be lost just like this. You know, you're, you're being a church like this where the truth is preached without fear, without favor. And where the totality of the word of God is revealed unto you. Are you playing games? Are you jesting? Are you joking? Are you trifling? But are you counting the cost? What if it happens to you like Saul? And then eventually you are gone. There's an unsettled thing. The adultery has not been settled. The fornication has not been settled. And you have not got the forgiveness. You don't have the peace of God in your heart. And you know that you are dying. You know that spiritually you are nowhere. And you are just making up. Have you counted the cost? Call upon the name of the Lord. It's a serious matter. Don't die in backsliding. Don't die in sin. Except a man be born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. And without holiness, no man shall see the Lord.